So launching an NFT project in the space right now can be quite a daunting task, particularly seeing that we are seeing the ebbs and flows of the crypto market right now. But there is some positivity to be had and I've managed to catch up with one of the most influential people in the space, Data, who is able to talk us through his brand new project, The Nerd Collective, and help you understand a bit of behind the scenes as to why he's launching this project right now and what makes this so special, but also the challenges that are going to be faced along the way, the investment that is needed for this, and the top tips that he would give you to make sure that if you're going to be launching a project anytime soon, that you do it in the right way too. So to start this video off, we're going to be deep diving into exactly what the Nerd Collective is. So let's dive right in. It's hard to talk about the Nerd Collective without talking about how it came to be, which is um, spent quite a, a bit of time in the space. It's almost been a year. And I, I really hadn't found one, a community that felt truly like home. There's some communities I really liked, you know, really Fame Lady Squad, Expansion Punks, V Friends, but it didn't quite feel like home. The second thing is there were some PFPs I liked, but didn't really feel like any of the PFPs really reflected who I was. But I, I, I set out with the initial goal of how can I help the little guy make smart decisions in the space to make sure they're not being taken advantage of by big traders, whales, institutions, right? And so like, hence the name data, right? It was all about providing people with the data to make those smart decisions. So those three things kind of came together. It's like, okay, well, it's been almost a year. I haven't really found what I want. But maybe it's time to think about creating it. At the time, everyone was complaining about having a million discords, right? So it's like, okay, well, what if we're just a, um, a project agnostic discord, right? Where you can come in, you can talk about whatever you want. There's no set topics, but also let's bring in announcements from all these discords and let's bring in experts from each of these projects. And so that we, you can have a, a single place to check and a single place to be. And it wasn't really necessarily about, supposed to be about anything beyond just, Hey, come ask some questions. Let's talk about pro like, like a, a, an alpha chat on steroids, but more just about bringing together like, like minded people. And then it quickly evolved. And I realized, well, there's something more here. The, we realized that we really like spending time with each other and we're kind of enjoying having a space to connect and not be forced into kind of, you know, and, and probably just do this for a good reason. They often say like, this is what you talk about in this project. And if it's not related to that, go into these kind of like ulterior channels in discord. And so people were just kind of enjoying having free, free reign and so kind of like all these things started to come together and I had an idea for a PFP of what if we created art that really reflected back who the community was, right? So rather than trying to put myself in the box of like, oh, I'm a, a pig PFP and I, you know, I really like the golden brimmed hat, right? Like let's do the reverse and let's create a collection that looks and feels and acts like the actual people in the community. So kind of, these things start coming together and, and slowly over time, it started to be really clear. Okay, well, what do we have in common? Well, we're all big nerds and yeah, we're all NFT nerds, <laughs> right? Uh, that, that's like the big connector. But if you talk to each person in this community, at this point, the community is a couple hundred people. Um, they have something that they love to do, something they love to nerd out on, right? So that, that could be gardening. We were talking to Zeneca last week on, on Spaces. He, he was a big gardening nerd. Right. So start to, okay, wow. Like nerding out is the, is this thing that everyone does. And you know, what's interesting is like, while the topic that you may nerd out on is different, the process by which you go through it is pretty similar. Right. So it's, it's not just, oh, I love ramen. It's that, wow. Like, why do I love ramen? And why is this ramen better than that ramen? And you know, what is it that this chef did that really brought out the umami that this chef didn't. And so like that process and that line of questioning could be applied across any topic. And that started to be really fun. And so it quickly became clear, you know, the project had initially been like, okay, all about data. We're going to have data nerds. Then I realized like, <laughs> no, like <laughs> nerds in general, it, this really interesting. In fact, I actually think everyone has a nerd in them. Mm. And so, and 
More importantly, I think there's a lot of nerds out there who don't necessarily feel like they have a safe space to be in. And part of that was hypothesis. Part of that was that's what people were telling me. They were saying, wow, I really felt, feel like I could come and be my authentic self here. And so started to kind of all these things start coming together and, and realize, okay, well, let's build these PFPs and let's do it where we celebrate different ways to nerd out. So we really focused on maybe more traditionally nerdy stuff, but could be anything, right? So we have um, playing the banjo or uh, tiki cocktails or uh, being a sneakerhead or a gearhead, right? So like all different ways in which you nerd out on your own topic and feeling like, you know, that's how you identify yourself. That's how your friends know you. You're like, oh, you're the, you're the person obsessed with, you know, free diving and you can't stop talking about free diving or, you know, whatever that topic might be. And that's how, that's just part of your identity and who you are. And so like, can we create art that helps reflect that back and is something that people feel more connected to? Um, so all these pieces start coming into place and then kind of the aha moment becomes, well, really what we are is we're a web three home for nerds. We're a place where we have resources, a community and utility and, and eventually utility here to help you be your authentic nerdy self, to help you figure out how to make the best decisions possible in the web three space, to help connect you with other like-minded individuals who have um, kind of like similar goals and shared values and, and that, you know, together, right. As individuals, it's, it's tough to keep up with all the projects, but together, right. You know, we could probably do some damage, right. We could probably really do some interesting things, uh, cover a lot of topics and figure out like, what is our path through these kind of rocky, treacherous web three waters and, and, um, you know, how do we come out the other side stronger? Yeah, yeah. And and this is the thing is that we are all nerds and to our Web2 friends, like I'm a nerd on NFTs and Web3, right? But between you and I, I'm probably a nerd about film and I'm obsessed about that stuff. So yeah. I, I totally get it. And, and having, there's a few things that you've brought out. So you talked about the little guy um, and I think the NFT space, and we should talk about the landscape in general, but the NFT space is, it has been that crypto bros, you know, those guys that have made a lot of money and it gives it that bad perception. Um, and actually the people who have come together from the community perspective, because throughout the pandemic, they found a home with like-minded people. It's also that space, but it's never really talked about in that way. So it's nice to have a hub with this of, of what, you've, what you've mentioned. And I think we can all certainly relate to that in a way. Um, I just want to ask, I suppose, as the next question as to what brought you into the space as a, as a nerd <laughs> and what well, was it? <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's, it's like you said, right? It's the pandemic. We're all feeling a little bit isolated, maybe a little bit bored. I was looking for the next thing and kind of stumbled through Gary V into, um, into NFTs. I'd followed him for a long time, some unrelated things and popped up on my Twitter feed and it, instantly it was the most fun I'd have since, had since like collecting Pokemon cards. And this was early days before so much stuff. And so it was like, whoa, like which V friends are going to be the popular ones and why might they be the popular ones? And, you know, let's speculate on the ones that we think are going to be kind of the ones that Gary pushes or like, wow, he put all these Easter eggs and it was just, he'd created this world that was fun. And I was just, I was instantly hooked. And I think I, kind of latching onto one of the things that you said, and I believe this is, is one of the most powerful pieces of the Web3 space is it brings like-minded people together. It doesn't matter what your topic is or what you're interested in. You're, you're not confined by who's around you geographically, right? You're able to connect with people whom you may never have connected with before, right? So when you, you and the interesting piece is that you're, because you're focused on NFTs and because most people are, aren't are doxxed, right? You don't know necessarily where they're from or who they voted for or what they look like. So it actually pulls away a lot of your preconceptions. And I find that people are so much more open and willing to connect. And, you know, I think 
the doxing is great and clearly we're both doxed here, but mm -hmm. there's something about being anonymous that has pulled down some barriers for people and allowed them to open up to others and see the human in each other in a way that they weren't able to before. Yeah. And looking at it now, I mean, you've been in the space a year, I've been in the space maybe a little bit longer than that. What's changed so dramatically for you in this space? Yeah, you know, it's hard to talk about what's changed without talking about the market, right? And so much of that was instigated by global issues going on. And the first big change was with the Ukraine war, right? That war happens, all of a sudden price of ETH, everything starts really crashing. Um, volume on OpenSea, etc. The game changes when there isn't much volume, there aren't, aren't as many people, right? And so I think all of a sudden people aren't trading day to day, they aren't so focused on making money, they're thinking a little bit longer term, which I think is really healthy, right? So like when you pull away some of um, this, uh, the more like pump and dump type projects or the upteenth um, little baby zoodle that we've seen or, you know, whatever derivative, right? And, and you take all of those away, it gives people space and time to think about, well, what are the products that really provide value, right? And that's, that, that's the important piece is like, when the money's flowing, you often think of just money as the only way to provide value, but so many other ways that a project or owning an NFT can be valuable, right? It could be a sense of pride or loving the collectible nature of a project and how the founders engineered that, or it could be a piece of utility or access to a community, right? So I think it's really forced projects and people to, to think about value beyond just floor price and airdrops and other ways that kind of print magic internet money. <laughs> and I suppose with the Nerd Collective, so let's have a look at like the timeline in which you thought, uh, despite all of this, now is a good time to bring this out because it's not about those traditional NFT values. Like, I always loved the fact that utility was this like real return on investment, but the definition yeah. of utility is very wide reaching and it's adapted and it's changed. So I suppose with the Nerd Collective, it didn't matter that all this economic stuff happened because it was about the people, right? Yeah, that's a great, I mean, I first, the, the seeds of the Nerd Collective were being kind of planted in January of this year, so January 2022, right? So right before the February, like massive bull run, if you look at the numbers, bigger than any bull run we've had. And so, you know, some of the things that we aspired to do then, we've pivoted and changed and done differently now. But what I will say is that we're trying to provide value to people in a number of ways. and the floor prices is, is a small part of that if at all part of that right and so when you're trying when you're not reliant on the market and on momentum and people pumping and hyping your project right it's a little bit less important what the market looks like right so it's it's more about finding people who see value in what you're trying to provide and so i, I think it's um if anything been positive in that people are, are having a deeper look and thinking beyond kind of the monetary piece. Yeah, but I mean, to your point about people, people are feeling a little bit lost right now. If you see on Twitter feeds, you know, a lot of posts about that. And so I, I, I do believe that now's kind of maybe serendipitously, but a perfect moment to find a group of individuals that you want to kind of stick with through this bear market and through some of these rough times. And so I think a lot of people have really found solace in our community and and other people who have kind of a different take or a positive spin on things. And so I think it's been a bit of a life raft for a number of individuals, many individuals uh, through some of these kind of harder market uh, conditions. Yeah. And actually the way I remember you starting the Nerd Collective was being invited into your Discord group, which I followed, you know, and still do for a while and you know that was before you announced this project and then being invited into the data 100 right which is obviously your pickings of people who are you know maybe influential in the community but yeah. also your friends and people that you trust as well um 
in terms of a strategy to get the momentum of getting your project off the ground, that was the direction you chose. Can you talk a little bit about that and your thinking behind that? I got the idea from Morgan Stone, who runs Root Troop. Um, he was like, you know, have a hundred people, give them a free token and, you know, they have skin in the game and they'll, they'll do anything for you. Right. And, um, <laughs> and here we are, <laughs> and, and here we are, right. Uh, but you know, I think for me, it, it quickly became not that first of all, that was 11 months ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was a long time ago. And for me, it was, it ended up being more about wanting to reward the people who stuck with me from the beginning. Right. And like, wanting to give back in a way. And so I think with the data 100, you know, I, the, the biggest or the most fun piece of it is I, I've been sharing the art for months, whereas we just revealed the art last month to, to the public or sneak peeks on the community or the logo or the name or, Hey, do you guys have ideas on how to launch this? And so it's, yeah, there's a piece where, um, you know, I'm trying to provide value, but it's like, I think it's just been fun to really involve the community in a larger way and actually creating the project. Right. Yeah. And which I think is something that businesses do all the time, right? They look at market research, but it's a little bit different when your users are also kind of your most prized users, that first hundred people who are in the discord, who you kind of like handpick to, to invite in. And it's, it's become so much more than just like, okay, Hey guys, like let's band together a hundred and hype this project up. It's yeah. become much more of like a, a, a community within a community. Yeah. And actually I felt very much, I really enjoyed, I think one of the first things we did as a day to 100 was that you held a big discord call with all of us yeah. and you wanted to share some of the artwork and talk us through some of the strategies and that immediately felt like we were so involved and excited yeah. to see what yeah. we were doing which was great and then from that the, com the conversation carried on which I think was really important and I know you and I then had a call which was kind of a bit of market research so what you were doing was actually taking those traditional business roots to market right. in a way yeah but it felt That's very right. web three <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I, I think the big difference is there's so many things i love about web three and what it does to open up options for businesses but i think one of them is the people who are your stakeholders they're not investors they don't own a portion of the company that's illegal <laughs> but they are your stakeholders because they're your token holders right and so your stakeholders are also your end users. Whereas a company like my stakeholders might be venture capitalists or Wall Street and my end users are someone different. But when your users are also your stakeholders, it changes things a little bit, right? Like mm -hmm. what they want to see out of the project changes things, but also your relationship to them changes. Like you said, like you said, taking something that was a little more of a traditional business tactic and making it more web three, it's like, I think the web three part for me was like, this is your community, your end users and your stakeholders. And so those conversations can be way, way different and deeper and you can involve them in different ways. It just, you know, we're still kind of navigating what all of that means, but it was a big unlock and something that was exciting for me. Yeah. And I can see from, you know, from the way that you are on Twitter, which is obviously the main platform that you're out on still building, even yep. though some people have sort of regressed a little bit back from Twitter and, and taken a step back there that you're still pushing hard. And that's where you've built an initial community. So we link kind of what you've done as a as an individual and how that is building into the strategies for the Nerd Collective. Yeah. You're building on something that you've been building for a, a year, right? And it's, yeah. not, it's not something like you can just jump in and just be like, right, okay, we're going to sell this that's out. Right. This has been a yeah. long time coming, right? I mean, I spent... The first, I don't know, so May to December, right? Wanting to build a project, but not feeling like I had anything to say or, or something to provide a value, right? And so through that time, I listened a lot and kind of tried to understand what people like, what they don't like, what makes a project good, what doesn't. And kind of there was a moment where a lot of things came together, but one of them was like, I think I get this and I think I see the holes and I think I can provide something different. 
right? Something that, that people want. And a lot of that's around identity, right? I think that um, really understanding like the PFP is, it's more than just an NFT. It's says something about you, right? Like the PFP that you have up there, whether it's the traits or the collection it stands for, it has become your Web3 identity, mm -hmm. right? And I, 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 and I haven't felt like there's been a project that from the start has really been thoughtful about what the identity is and thinking about like longer term, how are people going to continue to resonate with this and feel proud to represent, to, to have your, your project as a PFP and therefore kind of represent you out in the world. So many people are holding on to that and, and know the value of what that means to be part of that community. And that's, it's tribal in a way, isn't it? When, you know, you're, you're assigning yeah. yourself to X community and, you know, already seeing like you've got six, six and a half plus thousand on your Twitter handle, which actually in a short space of time, organically building. And then you yourself like have yeah. grown 30,000 plus. Right? Okay. I gotcha. yeah. yeah. So people are like buying into you because that you've spent that year building the trust of people and now know that what you're going to be doing is going to extend that into new directions. And I think that's, yeah. that's really like, I think a lot of people need to understand that it is that, that is the way that these things are going to go if they're going to be successful is that it isn't a, a flash in the pan that we've seen before. You have to put in the groundwork in order to be a success. Right. This isn't a quick, whereas it's a quick pump and dump market that maybe we might have had a few months yeah. ago. Um, yeah. What are the, uh, I suppose, the biggest challenges that you think you faced so far, knowing the landscape, knowing the way people's sentiments are right now, um, and also trying to build that future for the project itself? What have been those big things that have kept you up at night? <laughs> you know, the hardest things are the things you can't control, mm -hmm. right? So like, it's not just trying to hit one moving target, it's trying to hit seven. <laughs> so it's, uh, what's the price of ETH, right? Because whether we like it or not, people think in ETH on US dollars. So when we started planning the project, the price of ETH was, ETH was 3000, it dipped all the way to 1000. So it's like, well, I can't triple the mint price. Maybe push it up a little bit, but that's just not how people think about it. And so like all of a sudden our potential raise is going to be a third of what we thought it would. So that means we can do pretty different things than we initially thought about. Right. Um, there's then just the market, right? So there are just fewer people on Twitter, right? I got, I used to get 6 million, uh, impressions a month on Twitter. I'm getting like a couple hundred thousand now. Right. So, it, and you know, maybe that's the algorithm. Maybe that there's all sorts of things, but these are things that you just can't control. And so it's like, as things continue to change, you're having to adapt and, and, um, kind of readjust and figure out what works, what doesn't, and, and what makes sense for kind of the business. Cause the way we provide value is to run a business and, and pay people and, and build things. Right. And so like, I see that as the health of the business is the health of the project and that's how you know people are going to see value I, th then the other big thing is the regulation part of things right so work with a number of law firms at this point and people who are experts in ip and securities all sorts of things and it's changed a lot right so like <laughs> since we've started uh the sec has opened up and and said that they've opened up an investigation to yuga labs mm -hmm. we don't totally know all of all of the implications there, but we do know that, okay, well, that means they're going to come out with some sort of ruling, right? And so thinking about like, you launch the project, come out with a real ruling, what are the implications for you? Like, are they going to make you register? Are they going to make you trade under certain norms or, and, and then it's like, well, how can you be diff not be Yuga Lab? So if they come out with the ruling, right? You're like, well, you rule on Yuga Labs, but you can see here, like we're doing something very different. Just the market in terms of who's in the space, the market in terms of the price of ETH and, and demand for things. And then the legal things are just three kind of moving targets that you're having to hit. And so I, you know, adapting along, along those ways has been important. So it's been great to have some really strong kind of pillars and directions that we're trying to go. And so it's just like, how do you continue to hit on your goals and, and achieve those goals 
within whatever the new context is. What's happened in the past and how has the SEC done rulings um, for other types of gray area securities, right? So a good example is crowdfunding. Crowdfunding, you're raising money from individuals who are not accredited investors and you're promising the, this product. Well, the SEC has a whole exemption, a whole little like bit on crowdfunding and, so, and there's some caps there. For example, you can't raise more than $6 million. You can't have a certain amount of volume. Uh, you have a cap in the amount of volume you can have traded per month and you have to trade them through pre-approved accredited platforms. Hence we have Indiegogo and Kickstarter, right? Well, it's like, okay, well, NFTs are kind of similar, right? You're raising money uh, through an NFT, you're making promises. Well, what if they regu regulated us in a similar way, meaning there's a cap on how much you can raise, a limit on monthly volume, and you have to go through certain marketplaces. Like, so what implications does that have into, <laughs> your project and and right now and how we want to set ourselves up for that you know another interesting one is um golf courses right that's membership that you pay for there's been a lot of cases around that related to um securities and there's some nuance there around you know if you're raising money from members right if, if you're paying for membership and that membership money is going into building the golf course right they've ruled that as a security if you already have a golf course and members coming in. That's not a security. That's a golf course. So it's just, it's really interesting, all that nuance and wanting to protect your project and protect your holders and what that means. So like for us, we've been pretty careful about what we've been promising. We don't want to fall within that category. And so we have some utility we're going to launch with. We're announcing later this week, but after that, you know, our promise is to continue to provide value, but there's, we're not necessarily releasing hard and fast things that we're providing, right? So saying like, hey, you give us this money, we'll give you this back. And so I think just that's a great example of, we've had to have that conversation six times, <laughs> right? Because we've been building for 11 months and it keeps changing, you keep having to reevaluate and keep kind of like adjusting what your approach might be. That, again, that reinforces the point of, this is not a slapdash thing anymore. You can't just chuck out a PFP collection and there be no repercussions. There has to be, like any business, things that are really well thought out. And from a financial perspective for the, the health of the business as well, this is not all you doing all this work. You've built a team as well, and that That's team right. needs to be looked after. So how was, how was that in terms of your willingness to take on a team and grow that team and that responsibility? How did that kind of play out for you did you start small and then grow or did you know I needed yeah. these people right now? Yeah, so I'm a co-founder, his name's Jason, and we uh, we worked together for a number of years before NFTs, right? So my background's in building apps and websites, his background is leading technology teams, um, also building apps and websites. And so I, I knew that I need, needed someone to take on the tech side of things and someone I could trust to just get it done, right? And so. Uh, that was kind of like the first phone call I made. And then it's been um, a mix of individuals that I've met along the journey in the NFT space. And, um, you know, it's like you said, if I had just come in and said, hey, I have this project, I want to do it, like forget understanding the market, would never have been able to recruit the same types of people, right? Like mm. my network of having that many Twitter followers and having gained the trust of so many individuals, I got a lot of recommendations for really good artists. Right. And I was able to kind of pick one that really jive with her and Rachel Whiting. And so you know, we work on this art for 11 months together. And so in a, in a time and a space where there's very few people with expertise within, uh, web threes and NFT projects, like you got to take your time and, and get a little lucky in finding some of those individuals. The other thing too, is I, I've sunk a lot of personal money into this. And so is my co-founder to help fund some, some of these things. And haven't paid ourselves for for quite some time now and so yeah it takes some real seed money um unless you're you can try to find people who are willing to work for free for a long time uh which has complications right you're no longer the priority you know so i think it's it's tough and it's you got to find that right balance yeah yeah and that was you've just answered my next question about how do you fund that from the start because yeah I think, again, a lot of people bootstrapping this for a quick buck are going to be quite shocked that actually there's 
it's not that simple and there is you know you you believe in it enough to kind of put your own money behind it and a, a lot of people right. don't really realize that but that's thank you for explaining that i think that's really important yeah. um and so you're minting on the 15th of november some people will be watching this afterwards what are you expecting to happen first few months the first year what's the next five years look like <laughs> I, think, I mean for me my hope is that people get really excited about the specific nerds that reveal to them right so there's traits that they like there's traits that they want they're excited about the rare traits you know it kind of harkens back to some of, of what got me excited about the space is the collectability fa factor right and and in, in a big way, this is a collectible. Um, and so I think I'm excited to see that play out and see which traits people gravitate to. And I've released a lot of the art and people have seen a lot of the traits, but then you realize, oh, there's only 27 of that one. Like, wow, not only do I like the look of it, but man, does that say something about that, you know, the rarity of that. And so I'm just excited to be on the other side of that. I've been, uh, you know, for many projects, been the, the holder and the buyer for that and been, had a lot of fun kind of trying to figure out which tokens I want, which ones I feel connected to, which ones do I think um, are, are going to be rare. Uh, and just seeing that from the other side is going to be a lot of fun. And so I'm hoping that's kind of, you know, the first piece there because that's so much what this is about. It's like finding a token that you feel like speaks to you and represents who you are and that you feel proud to put up on Twitter. After that, I'm excited to figure out and continue to develop new ways to provide value. Um, we, we've done this, uh, a treasure hunt type of thing where initially I designed this treasure hunt to, um, identify individuals that had been, me from, with, been with me from the beginning to reward them. So similar to, to the data 100, but I hit 10,000 followers. I was like, man, you know, it's, there's a long time between now and when I have an allow list. Right, I'm getting a lot more followers, but I want to recognize the people who followed me to date. And so I started to be like, okay, well, how can I identify the followers that have been with me for a long time? Like, oh man, there aren't really good tools for that. Well, what if I put out a treasure hunt and ask questions that only the followers who have known me for a long time would know the answer to? Right. So the first was just what did I used to call myself, which was Data Lady. It was a name given yeah. to me, but only those who had been around early knew that. And so like that was one way and it quickly kind of evolved into something people just have had a blast doing, really loving all the comments and people talking about like, wow, this is the most fun I've had in the NFT space. I really, you know, enjoying this. And part of that is like, I built some really fun hunts with some awesome clues and games and all sorts of things that you have to deal with. I've built AI bots that you have to interact with and say the right phrases to so they give you answers, right? But part of it has also been that we've shifted it to more of a team event. So you have a, a group of five individuals that you're working with. And it's fun to see at the beginning, those people may be random individuals, but they've become some of your closest friends throughout the months as we've gone through phase and phase and phase of this treasure hunt. And so really facilitating some awesome connections and seeing people um, connect with each other. Now, we're taking the hunt to a new level uh, after launch. Um, not going to talk that much about that because that's the mystery is part of the fun, but super excited for that component. And then, of course, um, excited to, to build some things and, and really unveil utility in some of our roadmap. Yeah. So, you know, five years, it's a good question. You know, I think one of the things I've learned, and as we've talked about, the, chase, the space changes so quickly. Mm. Right. And so I don't know where we're going to be in five years because who knows what the market's going to be what the legal ramifications are going to be, you know, who's going to be around. And so it's all about having some plans and some, some larger goals and direction you want to go, but really adjusting even weekly, uh, if that continues to make sense. And if there's new information out there that you want to adjust a certain way, or the thing that you thought was going to be valuable, all of a sudden someone else is offering for free and it's like, well, let's not build that. There's already this tool that does that. And so I think, uh, it's just gonna be a fun, exercise and a fun journey uh as we just have a little bit of money also to pay individuals and to bring in a larger dev team and to do some larger more well-funded efforts yeah, yeah. say it again some cool stuff like to do yeah some really cool stuff. no we're excited yeah 
You should be because what it sounds like to me is almost like this is full circle, right? So you came yeah. into NFTs because you love the collectability, you love right. the buzz and the fun of it. And yeah. although the market has done this, you're bringing through the Nerd Collective us back to those things that you loved about this space. And that's where- because That's exactly right. And I think that part of that too is because I think that people forget that that's one of the reasons many people came to the space in, in the first place, right? We, we've gotten so lost in chasing the money that we forgot that, yeah, the money was part of it. And, and um, you know, you, you thought that you were gonna make a couple hundred bucks or a couple thousand bucks to go out to dinner or get a new iPhone. People weren't originally thinking about generational wealth, mm. right? Which has been like the unrealistic goal of everyone in the space, right? But like more like thinking about it as like trading cards or collectibles. Like almost everyone I've met collects something. Could be stamps, could be baseball cards, could be teapots, could be shot glasses, could be photos, could be, you know, could be memories, right? Like humans have this innate desire to collect. And I think that we're gonna see collectibles and people's love of collecting kind of really come back, like you said, full circle yeah. and shine a little bit more um, over time. And we see that with Reddit, right? And other places who are labeling these digital collectibles, which was how we always described it early on, right? This yeah. is like, think baseball cards, but digital. And um, I think going back to those roots is, uh, I'm, I'm making a bet there. And also it makes sense as to why when you came into the space, you're such a big advocate and still are for V Friends is because Gary, Gary Vee is all about like, he loves his trading cards and this is a new yeah. way of doing that and you know, how that changes. Um, what would you advise for someone coming into the space and wanting to do a project? Um, I think they'll be inspired having seen this interview now to go down, yeah. they can do it, but what would be some advice and top tips for them to kind of get started, particularly in the bear market that we're in right now? Yeah. The, be the best thing to do is find a community that you like. So look at a bunch of projects, look at some top tier projects, and um, you can find those by just looking at charts or, or graphs on OpenSea or elsewhere. Find some projects, find one that you feel connected to, right? So jump in all these discords, just get understand the vibe and, and find one where it's like, okay, yeah, I'm enjoying these people. Then spend as much time as possible for 30 days in that discord having real conversations chatting with people asking questions um, and after those 30 days you will have a master class in nfts right and just because of the conversations that will go on there the things that you see the leads that you follow up on the 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 your curiosity will take you down all sorts of rabbit holes and threads and I, and a lot of time, I'm saying like at least four or five hours a day. Um, out of that, you're gonna understand so much more about what it means to, to build and have an NFT project, what people care about, um, how to engage, right? And of course you build a Twitter and all these things, but that comes out of realizing um, and, and making those connections and having those conversations on Discord. So it's hard and easy, right? It's a simple thing to do, but it takes a lot of effort. Um, because it just so many things will come out of that effort, right? You'll have friends, you'll, you know, have that education that I talked about. You'll, um, have your own opinions. You'll have no, new questions you want to ask. And so it's just, it, it's exactly what everyone should be doing if they want to jump in. Wow. What a wealth of knowledge data is. And sometimes you just need to really hear from the people who are working and building in the bear market. And that is exactly what he's doing. So I hope you found that really, really useful. I've got another great interview for you. If you're looking for some more inspiration to really get your project off the ground, it's with the fantastic digital artists, Sutu, and he's got an amazing project, which he's not only only been building as an NFT PFP, but also as an even bigger piece of world building and brand building. So why not check this out, get some more inspiration, do your research, good luck with your project, and I'll see you on the next video.